The TV One News is proudly brought to you by. BSP, our bank, our people. Hello, this is TV One News. I'm Jasmine Arojack. And I'm Tracy Pa. Join me later for sports. In this edition, opportunists vandalize lay ambulance, court strikes out methamphetamine case, and Hull Kingston Rovers confirm Vipers partnership. Kompiam District is seeing progress through a health center, local school, and airstrip. With the benefits from these essential services, the small Maramb community is progressing well. I believe that God will bless As is the saying, this. prevention is better than cure. The main goal for Kompiam Health Patrols is basically this, considering how remote it is. Mission Aviation Fellowship collaborates with Kompiam District Hospital to fly medical teams to remote communities in Enga province to foster hope for disease prevention, education, and envisioning a brighter future for the children of the communities. For the Maramb community, registered rural doctor Ray Felua believes there is still hope for better livelihood. There's hope every time you see a school. Hope for many good things. Hope for the future. Hope that the common disease that we see will reduce every time you educate someone, you're passing prevention messages to them. More than 150 children attend the local school. Dr. Felua says this is enough students to build a community in the future. For me, as a doctor, I give advice to the aid post, CHW or nursing officer who's there at the health center. I think every opportunity that you get, you talk to them. So this is one of the, those opportunities. I remember all the other clinics that I've gone to. This is the only place that has a school. The community is situated at Ram Airstrip, where MAF operates. And Grave Jaka from the local community has seen the support from a school, Airstrip and Health Center has done over the years. Me looking all, thank you, man. I'll seek him, stop. School, Airstrip, and me looking. The community is praying that God will bless their children with a good education and perhaps one day those children will bring back that blessing to the community. The St. John Ambulance Service in Leh was targeted by heartless vandals on Friday, April the 12th, where perpetrators broke into an ambulance stationed in the Leh main market area, stealing crucial life-saving equipment. Carol Kiro Jr. has this report. The St. John Ambulance Service in Leh fell victim to heartless vandals who targeted one of their ambulances parked at the Leh Main Market area on 12th April. The perpetrators broke into one of the ambulances stationed at the Leh Main Market area, vandalizing the vehicle and stealing crucial life-saving equipment along with the personal belongings of paramedics. Among the stolen items was an automated external defibrillator a vital tool in treating sudden cardiac arrest cases valued at 15,000 kina. The total estimated cost of the stolen equipment and personal items amounts to approximately 21,000 kina. <coughs> Expressing condemnation and concern, Mumase Regional Commander Anderson Palm emphasized the gravity of the situation highlighting the dangers such acts pose to the community. Home stressed the significance of the AED not merely as equipment, but as a lifeline that can determine the outcome in critical moments. As for the progress of this incident, uh, normal police uh, protocol and procedures has been followed. Officers that had their personal properties and, and also uh, medical equipment stolen from the ambulance 
as file a police report statement at the lay police lay market police station on saturday 13th of april 24. Uh, at this point of time there's no leads or development regarding the stolen properties because the operators are not known and police at this time are not able to identify them we operate with the trust from the people especially the settlement suburbs and the village we do have security measures in place, but at this, at, for this incident, the uh, said vehicle was not installed with security system. In response to the incident, St. John Ambulance urged the perpetrators to return the stolen AED immediately, emphasizing the critical role it plays in saving lives. They appealed to the community for cooperation and support, urging anyone with information to come forward and assist in the investigation. Despite the setback, St. John Ambulance reaffirmed its commitment to providing emergency medical care to those in need, calling upon the community to stand united against acts of vandalism and theft that jeopardize public safety. A police report has been filed regarding the incident as authorities intensify efforts to apprehend the culprits and recover the stolen equipment. Karakidu Jr., TV1 News. Papua New Guinea and Fiji have reasserted their commitment to collaborate on training of PNGDF soldiers at the Black Rock facility in Nadi, Fiji. The Black Rock camp is a state-of-the-art peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief facility, which boasts a large-scale relief warehouse, logistics headquarters necessary to coordinate work on relief response a UN school, a medical center, and physical training facilities. The facility was built by Australia at a cost of 180 million Australian dollars, that is 400 million Kina. The proposed training is intended to prepare Papua New Guinea soldiers for deployment locally, regionally, and internationally on UN security and peacekeeping operations as well as to train and prepare them to respond appropriately to any natural and man-made disasters. Minister of Defense Dr. Billy Joseph conveyed this to his Fijian counterpart Pio Tiko Dua Dua at a bilateral meeting held on Friday 12 April 2024 on the occasion of Minister Joseph's official visit to the Black Rock training camp in Nadi. The collaborative initiative was first discussed between the ministers three weeks ago in Tokyo at the margins of the second Japan Pacific Islands Defense Dialogue. Minister Joseph was at the training facility in Nadi to iron out the finer details of the proposed long-term arrangement as well as to explore the opportunity for PNGDF soldiers to undertake short-term capacity building courses at the facility. As part of the short-term capacity building program, Fiji has extended an invitation to PNG to nominate four PNGDF officers to participate at a UN-sanctioned training course to be conducted at the Black Rock UN School in October 2024. The Fijian Armed Forces accorded Dr. Billy a quarter guard parade along with a traditional welcome ceremony upon his arrival at the Black Rock camp and given a tour of the facility. The minister thanked the government and people of Fiji for the warm reception and hospitality accorded to him on completion of his one-day visit. Mary Sula Kelaton, TV1 News. Lay City Authority is officially the new manager of the Sir Ignatius Kilage Stadium in Lay Morbe Province. Formalities were concluded on Friday, April the 12th to allow the smooth transition of the new management. The Sir Ignatius Kilage Stadium in Leh, Morobe Province, has been formally handed over to the Leh City Authority. Handover takeover documents were signed on Friday, April 12, between LCA CEO Robin Callistus and the PNG Sports Foundation CEO Albert Veratau. This follows the signing of a five-year lease agreement on October 3, 2023. Lay MP and Deputy Prime Minister John Rosso said it has taken a couple of months to get the details in the lease agreement done. He gave the assurance that they will work closely with the PNG Sports Foundation to improve and maintain the stadium, which has been left to deteriorate over the years. Rosso said LCA has taken over parks and recreational areas in the city 
and the stadium will be no exception as funding will be put into running the facility. The LCA CEO outlined that an operational budget has been approved by the LCA board to look at upgrading the facility and to get a new management in place as well. The indoor and outdoor complex are now under the care of LCA, including the netball and volleyball courts next to the Lay Rugby League Oval. Rosso has always stressed on restoring Lay to its glory days, the days when families can enjoy the city and its benefits without fearing for their safety. Aside from the infrastructural development that is changing the face of the city, under his leadership, the Lay City Authority is fighting to bring public areas and recreational facilities under its management, with the most recent one being the Ranwara. Kamala Guare, TV1 News, Lay. This is TV1 News. When we come back, harsher penalties for drug dealers and meth case struck out as police fail to pursue and prosecute case. Experience, a convenient and smarter way to do your banking with BSB Mobile Banking. You don't have to leave the office or your home to pay for bills. You can view your account balance, transfer funds, top up phone credits or purchase easy pay units wherever you are. Visit your BSB branch today to register now for BSB Mobile Banking. BSB Mobile Banking, the smarter way to bank. BSB, our bank, our people. He says the best hunters players come from his region. So does she. But there's one thing that brings everyone together. SB Laga, Bungim Yumi. The Toyota JD High Ace Bus comes in 14 and 15 seater, high roof luxury model, powered by 2.8 liters, JD engine for optimal performance output, fuel efficiency and quietness, designed with improved safety features and easy maneuverability for tire steering angle. The High Ace lift lift suspension and annular frame structure is opted for smooth ride, comfort and safety. Experience the ride on the High Ace Bus and experience the High Ace Pride, the bus that exceeds all expectations. Hiya, Mama. You eat them, but me add him special flavor. Put him more flavor, put him more taste. Add your kakaro, get up and big smile on face. Time for Kim Chicken, a great food for two. Sip, sip, the moo moo, yes, magic on you. Magic, the taste PNG loves. Right across the nation, we eat snack scrappers. Mmm, Emmy Trubla. All get a young planalapun, only like him snack scrackers. Only make him here, mm. no PG, one time lay biscuit company. It's crunchy and tasty, it's irresistible. Mm. To get along. Stefano has a child with me, and that gives me the right to be in this house. How dare you! Different flow. I'm Tommy Pike, owner of Tommy Pike Customs here in Greenville, South Carolina. We don't give up on old rides, we do what it takes to bring them back to life. Let there be life. There's no rules. And if there were, we'd probably break. <laughs> <laughs> it's go time. The new series, Custom Carolina, Wednesdays 8.30 on Turbo. Welcome back. Gulf police have warned people in the drug business that the justice system 
will not be lenient on persons found guilty of this illegal activity. Provincial Police Commander Chief Inspector Jeffrey Lem said Gulf Police has its share of problems like shortage of manpower and resources, but will strive to achieve the maximum with the logistics available. On April 10, 2024, the Kerama District Court sentenced 12 men, all from the Highlands region, who face a total of 281 years in jail for drug offenses, ranging from facilitating, conveying, transporting, to selling and distributing. Seven were charged with conveying controlled substances under the Controlled Substances Act 2021 and sentenced to 30 years each at the Bomana prison in Port Mosby, while five were charged for selling and distributing the drugs. The 12 suspects were caught between 26 January and 1st March 2024 in Kikore District when moving drugs from the Highlands region into Gulf through the Kikori Southern Highlands Highway. If not confiscated, the drugs would have been ferried into Port Mosby by sea or road. Provincial Police Commander Chief Inspector Jeffrey Lamb says there are dedicated police personnel who stop at nothing to ensure that bad people are caught, dealt with and put away from society, especially Kikori police who have tirelessly worked day and night to put these criminals behind bars. Drug dealers have been warned that the Gulf province is not a favorable place to do the illegal business. They can either quit or take their business elsewhere. Susan Oreape, TV1 News. An application to protect the rights of the Electoral Commissioner Simon Sinai was granted by the National Court today after a warrant of arrest was issued by police to have him arrested over allegations of accepting the writs for the day open electorate in Western Highlands province recently. According to his lawyer, Michael John, the warrant of arrest was issued by the chief magistrate on the 25th of February 2024, but it was to be defective. Therefore, they filed an application to protect Sinai's constitutional rights under Section 57 of the Constitution, which for the power and duty of the national court to inquire into, protect and enforce guaranteed rights and freedoms. In granting the application, presiding Judge Justice David Cannings ruled that the application be set for hearing on Thursday the 9th of May at 1.30 p.m. An Englishman who appeared before the Waigani Committal Court today to answer to charges of being in possession of methamphetamine walked out a free man after his case was struck out. Police had failed to ensure 37-year-old Wayne David Rook attended court for eight months. Administrative issues with police have resulted in Englishman Wayne David Rocky, 37 years old from Midland, walked off scot free from the Waigani Courthouse today. Rocky was arrested and charged with being in possession of methamphetamine on September 15, 2023 and arraigned by the court to stand trial. Today, the court had his case struck out. The police prosecutor dealing with the case said police failed to pursue the case, which included not transporting him to his court hearing for eight months due to the administrative issues that affected transportation. Rocky's lawyer, Frederick Langu, argued the eight-month period of waiting as denied his client's rights under Section 37, Subsection 3 of the Constitution, where it states in Clause 17 that all persons deprived of their liberty shall be treated with humanity and with respect for the inherent dignity of the human person. In making a ruling on the matter, presiding magistrate Paul Nee granted that the case be struck out due to the inability of the police to conduct a trial on time. He said administrative issues are internal issues that should be dealt with quickly. Prolonging the case for eight months is in breach of the defendant's rights. And he added that despite his race, he should be treated equally under the laws of Papua New Guinea, as is the same if he were in his country. Tracy Pa, TV1 News. Pacifan recently concluded its successful one-week BizKids Kidpreneur program in Port Moresby. 
inspiring and educating children aged between 7 and 14 about real-world business practices. The program aimed to ignite the spark of entrepreneurship in young minds. It started on Monday, April the 8th and ended with a graduation on Friday, April the 12th. PassiFund's BizKids Kidpreneur program recently concluded in Port Moresby, leaving a lasting impact on the city's youth. Over a dynamic week, young minds aged 7 to 14 were immersed in the world of entrepreneurship, igniting their passion for business and innovation. Forty kids signed up for the program and had an amazing week talking, thinking and learning about business. The facilitators took the kids on the theory-based sessions covering topics such as business vocabulary, how to start up a business, financial literacy, pricing, and customer selection. The children even had the opportunity to pitch their own business ideas and design their own logos. On the fourth day, the kids participated in a pop-up market event, where they brought their goods to sell, ranging from lemon trees, cupcakes, cakes, tea shakes, drinks, lemonade, boiled eggs, and sweets. Some even offered services such as car wash and babysitting. After the event, the kids did up their profit and loss statements to see how much profit they made. Pacifan founder and CEO Des Yaninen said, We don't have enough jobs for our people. Thousands of school leavers get pushed out every year with no opportunities. To fix our problems, we must focus on the next generation. I'm glad we kicked off our Kidpreneur School holiday program. Our biz kids made thousands of kina in sales and employed over 50 people during the one-week program, thanks to all that made it possible. Pacifan graduated all 40 kids. Five were awarded accordingly. The awards were given in the following categories of Top Entrepreneur for Senior and Junior Division, Highest Profit Award and Revenue Award, and Employer Award. Pacifan thanked all the parents for signing up their kids for the Biz Kids Kidpreneur program and expressed their deepest gratitude to the young CEOs who joined them. They hope to have ignited the entrepreneurship spirit in them so that they may continue to run their little businesses. Carol Kiru Jr., TV One News. And now the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.2644 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, Alkina was buying 0.2569 US dollars, 0.3942 Australian dollars, 0.2338 Euro, and 38.07 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee, cocoa, copra, and copper closed higher. Gold, palm oil, and crude oil closed the day lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed lower, the ASX closed lower, and all ordinaries closed lower as well. TV One News continues when we return with news making headlines overseas. Stay with us. Experience a convenient and smarter way to do your banking with BSB Mobile Banking. You don't have to leave the office or your home to pay for bills. You can view your account balance, transfer funds, top up phone credits, or purchase easy pay units wherever you are. Visit your BSB branch today to register now for BSB Mobile Banking. BSB Mobile Banking, the smarter way to bank. BSB, our bank, our people. A true champion is measured by their courage, their determination, and their passion to never give up and to always keep trying. With a delicious Milo and Milk taste and added nutrients, Milo and Milk is a great way to fuel our little champions with nourishing energy every day. Because true champions give it their all. Milo, PNG and Mia, buying PNG made. All Mama Flame is story all Sam. Me seven you seen flame flower long one yem. Yem seven me kim kai kai belong family belong me. You go more yet. Man belong me seven like him flower balls belong me want them kawa war na spring anya. All picking ni belong me seven like him to my pineapple donut me seven walk him low house. Ne me kumu mix him want them kia na karama pim long flower. Tasty hash browns. Time is Kelly one time all arpela kai kai. Me seven kissing more kai kai long all get a toy me throw more one time flame flower. You in a baking more one time flame flower. Hardware House is more than just a store. It is where quality meets affordability. 
where culture is proudly celebrated. Spanning nine provinces, we pride ourselves in offering top-notch customer support and services. We're more than just a store. We're more than a brand. We are Hardware House. someone's peace and tranquility. Disquiet. How far would you go for a stranger? You don't know what's out there. Land of gold. Terror has never run this deep. Meg 2, The Trench. New York, new rules. Scream 6. Dwayne Johnson on a rescue mission. San Andreas. moment my body told me to fight now survivors come forward to tell their stories he was like get in the car and i said you're gonna have to just shoot me right now of fear it was really terrifying to have someone attack my family emotion i don't know why but for whatever reason i decided to grab his gun panic he grabbed at my kids and i was just shaking and survival don't ever give up keep fighting don't stop i survived a crime And we're back. On Wednesday, the people of Solomon Islands head to the polls for an election many see as the most important in its history. After five years of rapid change, including a controversial pivot towards China, the country's Prime Minister Manasseh Sogavare is bidding for a record fifth term in office. But there are challenges for the top job, and they see a very different future for the country. For Solomon Islands Prime Minister Manasi Songavare, the message is simple. We register this country now on map because of powerful decisions, important decisions that you're making. We become relevant. Over the past five years, the enigmatic leader has pushed the Pacific nation in a new direction. And China is at the center of it. For the last 45 years, I've been struggling, countably is struggling to make headway in developing under present arrangements. His 2019 decision to switch diplomatic recognition from a democratic Taiwan to China triggered a tumultuous period for the country. Riots in 2021 and later the signing of a secretive security agreement. Now, finally, the people of Solomon Islands have a choice. It's not China that will develop Solomon Islands. It's not the US. It's not Australia. It's, um, it's us ourselves. Opposition parties point to the country's entrenched high youth unemployment and poverty. They say the country's health system is in dire shape, with drug shortages common. When you're standing in front of a patient who's dying, you know what to give, but you don't have it. Despite the challenges facing Solomon Islands, there's hope, and it's the nation's young people leading the charge. People are fed up of, you know, promises, you know, uh, uh, giving them better life because everyone just wants better life, better living. An election with the country's future at stake. The United States Embassy, represented by Ambassador Anne Marie Hatishok, pardon, Hastishok, refutes recent allegations of election meddling in the Solomon Islands. Articles circulating online accused U.S. aid of influencing the upcoming election which the embassy categorically denies. Ambassador Yasti Shok reaffirmed USAID's commitment to transparent, nonpartisan support for free and fair elections. She urged Solomon Islanders to discern truth from disinformation, emphasizing the importance of informed decision making. The embassy expressed confidence in Solomon Islands' democratic process and pledged continued partnership post election. The swag has long been a part of Australia's colonial history, and now remote communities are getting the chance to learn how to make them by hand.
Dan Fisher has been teaching job seekers in rural towns how to make their own swags as part of a community development program. This is my first time. It looked harder when I came here, but no one at there getting the heat and the heat here. The finished product, when you look at it, it makes you feel better inside. You want to watch this step, boys, because we've got to make sure we get these straps in the right place. So I'm Dan Fisher, and my job is to go into the community and teach these guys some new skills. I run courses on how to make swags. So the first step is basically marking out and, and cutting all your pieces. Oh, it's good so far, yeah. When I first started off, it was a bit funny. But now, after four, four or five days, I ain't getting started getting there. Yeah, measure it and um, cut it out. No, I didn't make a swag before, but it was my first time making it. When I'm running the courses, I'm always talking to the boys about getting work, how to maintain work, and it's, it's more about getting them job ready, which seems to be working. We're getting a lot of boys that come and do the course, and then they find employment somewhere else because they get used to that coming to work every day and doing something, you know. You have a look on the bottom. They sew oh, that. That's waterproof. And it's I think it's fantastic. I've been around the whole country. I've never seen anything like this. And it's just so practical what you're doing. Did you ever think you'd be using a sewing machine? Um, not really, but... I just... But this program is precisely the sort of thing that we want to see. So the idea is that communities develop their own enterprises uh, and it means income for the community. All the communities that I go into absolutely think it's a great thing. I'd like to see the eventual start-up of, of a business for somebody out there, you know. It's not just swags, they can do shade sales, they can do all that sort of stuff. I mean, the pride in these guys when they complete their swag and they get to take their swag home is out of this world. In the past decade, 10 coal-fired power stations have closed across Australia and many of them have been left idle. Now a Sydney-based company has proposed a new lease on life for one in the Hunter Valley. Verdant Earth claims that its biomass-fueled plant will eventually produce near-net-zero emissions. However, others doubt that achieving near-net-zero emissions is possible. Andrew Mosley has been trying to manage the invasive scrub on his farm for years. The native weeds can be cleared under strict guidelines. The people typically lay it down with machinery, so it chains and bulldozers, and then push it into heaps, uh, and then, then burn it and put it back into the atmosphere. But now there could be a way to make money from it. Anywhere where you're burning anything, really, in my view, it should be putting into a power station creating electricity. And that's the plan at this former coal-fired power station in the Hunter Valley. Red Bank has been idle for 10 years. Now, Verdant Earth Technologies wants to fire it back up using biomass. It delivers on 24-7. It actually supports wind and solar and batteries. And it really gives Australia the energy security it can need, utilising our massive natural resources. The company claims it'll be a net zero operation, but environmentalists fear it means more carbon emissions and air pollution. There is a lot of concern among the community about this project, uh, you know, largely to do with tree clearing and the impacts that that will have on the local environment, but also to do with climate change. The Australian energy market operator says the country's remaining coal generators will all close within the next 15 years. It's forecasting an energy shortfall from as early as next year. Experts say it's unlikely biomass will play a large role in the grid. It is difficult for that harvesting, processing and central facility uh, and that all of the costs of that add up. To build something like this from scratch today is estimated to cost $720 million. That's more than double the cost of a solar farm or wind farm project of the same megawatt output. But to transform this once coal-fired generator into a biomass plant, Vernon says will cost them around $80 million. The company's long-term plan is to grow fuel on its own land. For now, these weeds could hold all the power. The Victorian music industry has welcomed the announcement of a $10 million funding boost for live music venues and festivals. But as the industry battles rising costs and cancellations, insiders warn it's not a silver bullet. 
global talent on show. Oh, and under threat as live music venues and festivals struggle to stay afloat. We've seen really significant cost increases across the board in terms of um, staging, infrastructure. It's a really challenging touring environment. One of the biggest price hikes has been public liability and cancellation insurance. So to give festivals the comfort to know that if they have a high fire danger day or if they have flooding that they are covered. As costs go up, ticket sales have gone down. 56% of music festivals failed to turn a profit last financial year. Dozens have been cancelled. Today, a lifeline, a $10 million stimulus package to keep the music playing. Effectively pumping money into those venues and the festivals to ensure that they've got that bit of relief in terms of the cash flow pressures that they're facing. The program will offer $10,000 grants for eligible live music venues, $50,000 for festivals. For small festivals like ours, um, this grant is really valuable. It allows for space for us to focus on other things including marketing, promotion and we can put all of our energy into what matters most is the art. While it's welcome, Obviously there's more to be done. And the federal government wants to know what the next steps should be. It's launched an inquiry into the live music industry that will report back on its challenges and opportunities. To find solutions that strike the right chord. Thank you. Solomon Islands musical prodigy Charles Mamairosia is set to enchant Melbourne with a harmonious blend of tradition and innovation. Hailing from the remote Pipisu village of Malaita province in West Are Are of Solomon Islands, Mamai Rossier's upbringing amidst the verdant landscapes has shaped his unique musical identity. On Saturday, May 18th, the Melbourne Recital Centre will host Maima Rossi's captivating performance where he will seamlessly fuse Solomon Islands heritage with contemporary musical culture. Recognized for his role as a guardian of custom knowledge through song, Maimarossia's artistry reflects a profound connection to both traditional roots and modern influences. His acclaimed album, Are Are of 2020, has garnered widespread acclaim, with its tracks featured prominently in the documentary musical film, Small Island Big Song and Oceanic Songline. From his secluded home studio, Mamarossia shares insights into his creative process and anticipates the upcoming performance at the Melbourne Recital Centre. Those are the songs for us to make something that will sustain our air, our ocean, our land, to use it in a sustainable way through music. I'll be crafting a mosaic of contemporary musical styles intertwined with traditional elements. Audiences can expect a symphony of modern sounds interwoven with ancient melodies and rhythms, promising a truly unique and captivating auditory experience. Immersed in the rich heritage of his Are Are culture while embracing modern influences, my Marossius music transcends boundaries resonating with audiences across the globe. From the depths of his ancestral village to the bustling city of Melbourne, his melodies serve as a demonstration to the enduring power of tradition, innovation and the universal language of music. Carol Kitter Jr., TV1 News. And that ends the news segment. Later in sports with Tracy, Digicel ExxonMobil Cup kicks off and under-16 OFC Championship starts. Honking is doing your head in. Why don't you go and put a stop to it? Oh, maybe not. Bing, bang, bing. Bing, bing, bang. New Fabuloso Multi-Purpose Cleaner with an irresistible fragrance that lasts all day long, creating a field of flowers in every corner of your home with an irresistible fragrance that lasts and lasts all day long. Fabuloso Irresistible Fragrance. 
Hi, I'm Chef Jules Hennell, and this is where my true inspiration for cooking started. Like most of us, I learned to cook from my mum. Nothing beats simple recipes where fresh local produce is at the heart, especially when it's a home-cooked meal, prepared and shared with the ones you love. And in PNG, no meal is complete without rice. And my choice is always True Guy. True Guy, true inspiration through generations. Life is filled with unexpected twists and turns. But as a public servant, your health care, life insurance and family security matters most. Introducing the Public Service New Care Association, PSNA. Your life's partner in health care, life insurance and guaranteed financial security. With PSNA, you receive quality health care services and immediate payment coverage using our smart card. Join the Public Service New Care Association today and experience the benefits that matter most. We are here for you today and tomorrow. PSNA, your partner in health and future security. Attention business leaders, the 39th Australia Papua New Guinea Business Forum and Trade Expo. From May 13th to 15th on Australia's dazzling Gold Coast, dive into the immersive experience of our Trade Expo and showcase your brand, connect with like-minded professionals and seize the moment to tap into the flourishing bilateral business environment. But hurry, reserve your spot now to secure your stay at the Sheraton. Register today for the Australia PNG Business Forum. Sabo's prophecy and true, one by big the fight by command. When the time come true, me hope for him to have life yet to fight in this position you talk of, man. Me plan must make sure to protect him. I got a line blue me, especially Malia. Me plan ready, but chosen one to meet Welcome back. Tonga and Solomon Highlands walked to a winning start, securing victory over opponents American Soma Samoa and Papua New Guinea at the OFC Under-16 Men's Championship 2024 qualifiers two days ago. They have all boasted set to strike out their contenders on Tuesday, April 16th, with Papua New Guinea hopeful to register a win. After the Solomon Islands' spectacular victory against Papua New Guinea in the first match, PNG is regrouping to make amends for a humiliating 14-0 loss. Host Tonga followed a similar script, at least to start their match, scoring inside five minutes and beating Samoa 3-0 last week. Both teams recording wins against their names will not come by easily as the competition sets up an intriguing encounter on Tuesday, April 16. Tonga is set to clash with the Solomon Islands. Both on a winning run, it should be a tough showdown, while American Samoa takes on Papua New Guinea. PNG having learned from their threshing from the Solomon Islands will hold their heads high to claim victory, but will need a good set of play under the guidance of first-time coach Marty Terry. Susan Oreape, TV1 Sports. After conclusion of the round five on the weekend, the corporate volleyball competition had made a successful start, is facing some hiccups with a few teams representing various organizations and companies are not adhering to rules and regulations. Competition President Alfred Vita and executives have stressed the importance of ensuring that only eligible players, including workers and their spouses, participate in the competition. 
Vaite added that it is crucial to maintain the integrity of the competition and called on organization to review the team list to confirm that all players have genuine IDs and are eligible to participate. The executives stressed that having to give room to outsiders other than staff to play defeats the purpose of corporate volleyball. Hal Kehar are excited to confirm the club has entered into a groundbreaking development partnership with leading Papua New Guinea club, Port Mosby Vipers, RLFC. The formalities took place in Port Mosby during the Money Plus NCD Vipers season launch at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium on Friday evening. It was attended by the Hal Kingston Ro Rovers club chief Operating Officer Craig Franklin, Head of Academy Jason Letterton, and PNG's prodigal son and Hal Kingston Rovers legend John Hockall. Speaking at the launch of the groundbreaking partnership between Hal Kingston Rovers and the Port Mosby Vipers, Hal Kingston Rovers Head of Academy Jason Netherton said this partnership has been 12 months in the making. Hull, as a club, has a great history with PNG Rugby League, and this will allow that affinity to continue. Hull Kingston Rowers Chief Operating Officer Craig Franklin said travelling 9,000 miles from the north of England to PNG speaks volumes about the significance of this unique rugby league partnership. We're here today making the effort to travel 9,000 miles to show you how... <laughs> to show you how seriously... We are taking this opportunity to work with you, to thank you and your people for the enormous contribution you've made to our club over the nearly 30 years. And Built on the storied history between Hal Kingston Rowers and PNG, the unique pathway will allow two juniors from the Port Mosby Vipers to link up with the Robins Academy, play for the under-18 side and inspire to play for the club's first team. Head of Academy Jason Netherton said, after establishing the first direct development pathway of its kind with the Papua New Guinea domestic side, Hal Kingston Rowers will now look to identify talent from the Port Mosby Vipers before the players join the club's junior setup ahead of the 2024 academy season. With this partnership is the opportunity to give two young um, Papua New Guineans the opportunity to come over to England and express that passion in our sport in the Super League. During their first time with Hull Kingston Rowers, the prospective players will be given comprehensive education and welfare support whilst with the Robins to aid their personal development and integration into the new environment. And City Governor and Vipers patron Paul Sparkop said this is a milestone sport deal sealed between two football rugby league clubs in the United Kingdom and PNG and it opens a huge opportunity to expose young Papua New Guinean talent to the world. As patron, he assured the Hull Kingston Rowers Club of his earnest commitment to support the partnership. And we all should take you from it and welcome it. And so as the patron, governor of our capital city, I want to thank Hull Kingston Rowers for having confidence and entering into this uh, relationship and agreement to set up this partnership for the uh, Rugby League Academy. Port Mosby Vipers have a rich history in PNG with the club winning the national club in 1990, 1992, 94 and 2013. The club has a strong foothold nationally in PNG while being the flagship club in the metropolitan city of Port Mosby, the country's capital. Terry Longwood, TV1 Sports. Former Highlands Zone representative and PNG International John Okal, now based in the UK, is back in the country as part of the visiting Hull Kingston Rovers club officials. They arrived in Port Mosby on Thursday for the launch of the groundbreaking partnership between the Port Mosby Vipers and the Hull Kingston Rovers Rugby League Academic Pathway. Okal made his international debut for the PNG Kumuls in 1994 and played in another three-test match, including two at the 1995 Rugby League World Cup in England. 
Following the World Club Ocal and teammate, Stanley Ginny was signed by the Hull Kingston Rovers and are now club legends. Since signing up with the UK club in 1996, John Ockel now calls Hull his home away from home after almost 28 years. Prior to becoming a Kumul, Ockel was playing for Foundation Moravia franchise Lay Bombers and the Highland Zone between 1991 and 1994. While playing in the Super League, Ockel continued to represent the Kumuls in a number of occasions. He also represented PNG at the Super League World Nines in Fiji. At the peak of his career, he played for Hull Kingston Rowers between 1996 and 1998. After he was hampered by injury, Okul had a stint with the Doncaster Dragons and Barrow Raiders. In 2002 and 2003, he played for the West Hull in the Bala National Conference League's Premier Division. Okul is back in the country this time as part of the Hull Kingston Rowers team that officiated the milestone partnership agreement with the Port Mosby Vipers Academy program, which coincided with the Vipers' season launch recently. Okul spent a few minutes sharing his amazing rugby league journey, his passion for the game, and how he's embracing the Western culture. Okul first recalled the amount of communication and dialogue that took place between them and the Hull after the 1995 World Cup. That 95 World Cup, mm -hmm. with England, now all the asking Mibla, Mibla changed him all information, then Mibla come back again. 96, Mibla go, Fiji play super, super nice to Fiji. And then, uh, on the, our Tupla board of directors flew from England to Fiji. That when Mibla signed him contract. So February 96, and then uh, March of 96, Mibla stand fly. The rest of you, say, history, history also talk here. Okul and fellow countrymen Stanley Gene and Makali Aizue have made a big impact in the club history as cult heroes with huge followings and that has contributed immensely to the success of the iconic English club. He said the fans there are just as crazy as Papua New Guineans about rugby league. Club, we play in there, we play in there. All day rugby side, rugby, rugby mad city. You got Tupla, Tupla team no the city. You got FC, all of Cena, all Kingston Rovers, and Mibla play, me, Stenla. The LM Mark, Makali go, Mibla play one time, sub down. Then we go back in all supporters, we do it. Supporters, all look after you. Crazy. All look, yeah, very crazy supporters. You know, they look after you. And everybody, you walk on the streets, they talk to you, all they talk about is rugby. It's like actually PNG. You feel as if you back in PNG where people only talk about rugby. Yeah, it was like that. Okul expressed so much satisfaction and joy, saying that he and Gene's influence at the club played a big part in the partnership forged between Hull Kingston Rovers Club and the Port Mosby Vipers. This is the start of a new era and junior pathway for the Vipers and PNG Rugby League as a whole. Terry Longwood, TV One Sports. That's it for sports. Over to you, Jasmine. Thanks, Tracy. And now the weather forecast. Southern, isolated showers and thunderstorms. Port Mosby partly cloudy with possible few showers. Umase, scattered showers and thunderstorms. Lay partly cloudy with possible showers. New Guinea Islands, scattered showers and thunderstorms. Kokopo, Rabaul and Lorengau, partly cloudy with some showers. Highlands, scattered showers and isolated thunderstorms with areas of rain. Mendi, Tari and Wabek, some rain, showers and possible thunderstorm. Ocean forecast, Coral Sea, seas rough with east to southeast winds of 10 to 20 knots. Bismarck Sea, sea smooth with east to southeast winds of 5 to 10 knots. Coastal waters forecast, waters of Samara Island to Cape Vogel and all Milling Bay Islands, seas 1 to 2 meters rising to 3 meters along the warning areas. Waters of Fincher Fen through Vitia Strait to CRC Long Islands, seas 1 to 2 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands, waters of Bougainville, seas 0.5 to 1.3 meters. And that ends the news tonight. Thanks for your company. Bye now.
The TV1 News was proudly brought to you by BSP, our bank, our people.